The new Crow trailer released and has been ruffling quite a few feathers, and it's easy to see why. The original Crow is absolutely phenomenal. It's beautifully shot, wonderfully acted, and is a great revenge tale. And with the tragedy involving Brandon Lee, the film also serves as his legacy. So people are taking this as a slight against Brandon. However, I'd argue that The Crow's legacy has already been tarnished three different times. Heck, even the unmade Rob Zombie movie, The Crow 2037, also looked like a massive turd. I'd argue this franchise has never been exactly great, but there's one that stands above the rest in its crappiness, simmering in a stew of trash and filthiness. So today, join me as I see just how awfully good is The Crow Salvation. Let's get this out of the way right off the bat. There is absolutely no replacement for Brandon Lee. He is so utterly perfect for the role of Eric Draven that every subsequent actor, even when playing a different character, pales in comparison to what Lee brought. No one is ever going to be able to stand in his shoes, and that's okay. I'm going to do my best to not just constantly compare this to the original, but it's going to be hard not to. I mostly remember Eric Mabius as the douchebag from Resident Evil that would eventually become Nemesis. And honestly, he's not half bad here as Alex Corvus. We're introduced to him as he's on death row for the murder of his girlfriend. Anyone who knows anything about the Crow knows that he definitely didn't murder her. Give him a better script and I'm sure that he would have been pretty decent. The film's quality certainly isn't his fault as he's definitely one of the best elements of the entire thing. The Crow Salvation follows Alex Corvus, executed for murdering his girlfriend, returning from the grave and seeking vengeance on those that murdered her and framed him. Alex's path for retribution is to take down the corrupt cops that took his girlfriend from him. The execution at the beginning of the film is one of the most absurd scenes possible as it's as movie as you can get. They definitely didn't watch the Green Mile for tips. The executioner with his large black hood. He looks like a Scooby-Doo villain. Then there's this mask. What in the fuck is this thing? Is it really necessary? It makes him look like a slasher villain. And the execution itself is anything but smooth. But don't worry, it's not like there's a literal child watching it. Oh wait. So yeah, we have Kirsten Dunst here taking on the part of Aaron Randall. She's essentially playing Sarah from the original, but without the charisma or, you know, interesting character. I usually like Dunce, but she's pretty bland here. And it's crazy to think that she's just two years away from being Mary Jane Watson. She mostly just screams at Alex about her sister and doesn't come to grips with reality until her dad gets killed. She's far from the strong, independent go-getter that Sarah represented. Her father is played by William Atherton, but he's kind of just in and out of it very fast. Remember Eric Draven's return from the grave as he digs himself out from where he's buried? It's an incredible moment. Alex's rebirth occurs in a morgue, and he ends up looking like a burnt-up zombie due to the electrocution. As he takes away the chunks of flesh, he's revealed to, wait, the crow makeup is just now on his face? How the hell does that work out? At least make sense of it by having the burnt up look somewhat resemble what's underneath. But nope, it's just zombie to crow in an instant. But hey, it's better than whatever the hell this is. And I love how people can't recognize Corvus in his new form. He looks the exact same only with some crow makeup. It's pretty standard. How are these people not getting that it's him? But hey, that happened in the original too, so I guess I can't dog it too much. And he has his usual Wolverine level of healing abilities, which gets shown off throughout the film. The best is when Alex intentionally shoots himself in the head, and then we see his head recreate itself from the inside. They don't totally pull off the effects work, but it's a really neat concept. I wish we would have gotten more of that. But one of the funniest additions is that Alex can actually become a crow. The Crow is no longer a surrogate that signals Draven's presence, and also works as an almost power conduit. But he's also that too. 
It can be a bit confusing, and I'm not even sure if the filmmakers completely understood their own rules. Because there's times where it seems like he's transforming, and then there's times where it seems like the crow is just hanging out. You be the judge. One aspect I enjoyed about the film is that Corvus is on the hunt for corrupt cops. He's going off the witness list of his wrongful conviction and working his way down. Makes for an interesting revenge tale as it's a different kind of criminal. These aren't just scumbag drug dealers or the typical criminal. And we've got quite the lineup of character actors with Walton Goggins, Tim Decay, and even Fred Ward as the corrupt captain. I really enjoyed them, even if they're pretty one-dimensional in their evilness. I guess one thing that they get right is that the world is all sorts of fucked up. Just look at this cop pulling over these girls. He enters scumbag mode right away just because these are underage girls who have been drinking. He's immediately ready to just full on rape these women. Holy what? 15? Excuse me, these girls are no less than 25. Then look at this news report. This reporter full on passes the police line and reveals the corpse all on live TV. This world is nuts. The flashbacks of Alex and his murdered girlfriend Lauren come across really poorly. It tries to be quirky and light, but fails with lines like this. Your flying crane style is no match for my drunken tiger kick. Because of this, it's really hard to give a shit about Alex and Lauren's relationship. Unlike Shelly, who is repeatedly established as an absolute sweetheart. Even her death fails to make much of an impact which is a big problem for a crow movie. One of my favorite tropes in films are how cars are essentially just explosives on wheels, and this movie provides the funniest example of this. Alex crashes this cop car and puts on a sweet new jacket. As he drops the cigarette lighter down onto the leaking gas, it explodes in such a way that it propels into the air, dropping a helicopter out of the sky that I didn't even realize was there. Then the bus goes up in flames too. Oh, and this car was too close too, so yep, up in flames as well. An intriguing element of salvation is that the main bad guy, Captain Book, is fully aware of what's happening. He knows that Alex came back from the dead due to a crow and will keep killing until he completes his mission of vengeance. So Book gives Alex the one person that he's been hunting down for most of the film. The Scarred Man. Except not really. Since Book is actually the Scarred Man, he tricks Alex into thinking that he already killed him, therefore ending his mission of vengeance before he can actually complete it. But it really doesn't go anywhere, as we're treated to the big final act regardless. It's just not as smooth getting there since Alex has to die and then be brought back yet again. There's some cool stuff, like Kirsten Dunst having her mouth sewn shut, but it's mostly just contrivance after contrivance. Alex somehow gets Book into the prison that he was electrocuted at and fries him. His death is considerably more violent than Alex's, and it works as a decent send-off for the bad guy. Even if the journey getting there was simply… odd. Alex returns to the grave and Dunst's Aaron is now an orphan. Oh boy, what a happy, happy ending. Now that we've made our way through the story, let's grab some libations and play some awfully good drinking games. Kaka! Take a drink whenever a crow appears. Take this on a scene by scene basis, because if you do it for every individual shot, you may pass out after the opening. Um, boobs? Take a drink whenever completely random nudity happens. I'm not going to ever call this a bad thing, but I am going to mention it as it happens more often than you'd think. Metal Mayhem. Take a sip whenever your ear holes are assaulted by some lovely metal music. Whether it's Rob Zombie, Danzig, or Static X, just make sure you're headbanging as you do. Thank you! Now that we've got some drinks in us, let's look into the production and find some awfully good trivia. Was originally planned as a theatrical release, the decision was made to go direct to video after poor test screenings. Rob Zombie was originally set to make his directorial film debut, but was fired due to creative differences. Original Crow writer James O'Barr liked the concept of the villain already understanding the legend of the Crow, so much so that he used it in his own comic. The Crow, Skinning the Wolves, released in a single theater in Spokane, Washington in order to satisfy contracts. Alex's last name of Corvus is based on the word Corvidae, which is the family of bird that crows reside in. Thanks to a bunch of corrupts getting theirs, we've got a massive body count of 28. 
Bad movies are at their worst when they're bland. So on a scale from Victor Salva to Roger Corman, I'd give this an awfully good rating of a 3. It's a boring journey that we've already been on and fails to execute any of its new concepts. The Crow Salvation is everything wrong with direct-to-video sequels. Lacking in any kind of passion for filmmaking, this is simply checking off the boxes in order to call itself a Crow film. And that didn't have to be the case, as the concept of a man avenging his murdered girlfriend against corrupt cops has a lot of potential. But without any care put into it, there's a lack of understanding concerning which elements are needed for a Crow film. I hope that by the time the Bill Skarsgård film releases, hopefully we won't be featuring it on this show, because God knows we do not need another bad Crow movie. Was that it? It's awfully good.